Sleep. Grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 again. That's where we're going to be this morning as we continue our message series called I Found a Reason. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles so you can follow along or open your Bible app. If you have the Version Bible app, you can follow along, look for um, Barberton First Church of Christ in the Bible app, and you'll find our event listed there. You can take notes and stuff, follow along there as well. So 1 Peter is found, if you kind of t- turn toward the end of the Bible, uh, after Hebrews and James, and then 1 Peter, so t- just to help you out. This morning, we're going to focus on uh, spiritual growth, spiritual growth. Just as we expect a baby to grow as the baby gets older, to grow in height and weight and understanding, God expects us to grow spiritually as well. We don't stay the same. He, he transforms our lives if we allow Him. So if I showed you a, a current picture of my daughter, Olivia, hi, Liv. If I showed you a current picture, if you looked at Olivia right now, but if she were to look like that little baby we had 14 years ago, if she were the same size and weight and she still couldn't walk or talk and had no understanding, you would say that something was seriously wrong, right? There's something not right. After 14 years, you still look like a baby. Something is seriously wrong. The same principle applies to us spiritually. It's sad when followers of Jesus Christ have been, let's say, followers of Jesus for 25 years, but have shown no growth. Uh, they may be 25-year-old Christians, but the real, realistic outlook is that they've been a Christian one year 25 times. There's something wrong with that. We as Christians ought to be growing more mature in Christ. I, I'm with Paul in 1 Corinthians, <laughs> his letter to the Corinthian church. He's frustrated. And right out the gate, three chapters in, verse 1, he says, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready. He is so frustrated with the church that they're not growing in Christ. They're not becoming mature in their walk with Jesus. And so far too many, in my opinion, far too many Christians are stunted in their development in Christ. They're going nowhere. And while I'm sure each one of us could identify someone in our lives that we could point to and say, yeah, man, that's a strong Christian right there. Church, I'm telling you, it's time that many of us sitting in this room, watching on Facebook, it's time that many of us, we become that strong Christian. It's time to, Peter says to, in in chapter 2, grow up. It's time to grow up into, into our salvation if you've tasted that the Lord is good. There is more to the Christian life than what some of you may be experiencing. You might think it's dry and stale and boring. Man, it's not. Perhaps you're too satisfied with having been saved, but salvation is more than just a, a fire insurance policy for eternity. It's not about just you getting into heaven. It's about heaven getting into you right here on earth, becoming stronger. It's about, and really this is what we like to say around here, it's about looking more and more like Jesus Christ. One of our L statements says that we are to learn how to follow Jesus better. Another L says that we are to live for Him every single day. How do we do that? We're going to get into that. Peter challenges us to the meaty truths of God's Word, to see that He is good. And we're going to look at three areas in in which we need to grow deeper in our Christian lives so that we can ex- experience the abundant life that God it, it wants for us and wants to give us. So let's jump in, First Peter chapter 1, look at verse 13. Uh, Peter writes, he says, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, you should underline that phrase, ready for action. He says, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. First, we are to grow deeper in Christ mentally. We've got to come to a better understanding of God's will. 
I hope you underline that phrase, ready for action. The King James Version translates the Greek literally, and it says, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. What does that mean? It's it's this picture of a first century guy. Back then, they wore these long robes, okay? So it's this picture of this, this first century guy who pulls his robe up just high enough so he can run with all-out force, so he can run and get the job done and get ready to work. It's that kind of picture. We would say in today's language, you would say, it's time to roll up your sleeves and get to work. It's the same idea, okay? So unfortunately, I think society places uh, maybe too much emphasis or more emphasis on feeling than thinking. You know, when you really think about it, you know, there are songs that I love. I have no idea what the lyrics are, but man, it makes me feel good. (laughs) I put that song in my car, and I turn that radio up. Wow, that's great. Don't know what they're saying, but it feels good, right? Movies. Man, you should see this movie, such and such. It is so sad, it's going to make you cry. It just made me feel, oh. This is the society we live in. People are told, follow your heart. Trust your gut. Um, You know, if it feels good, do it. This is the society we're living in. And even church services, are evaluated more on how they make us feel rather than how much we can learn, how how much we can learn and apply to our lives. We walk out of church and say, man, it felt great to be in church today. Now, I, I don't want you to get me wrong here. I think feelings and emotions are good. In fact, God has given us emotions and feelings for good reason. I believe God can speak to us through those feelings and emotions. We ought to pay attention when we're feeling happy or sad or angry or romantic or anxious or whatever. We ought to pay attention to those feelings because God may be trying to tell us something in those things. These are God-given feelings. Even King Solomon wrote that there is a time uh, to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. We ought to have these feelings and emotions, but God has also given us the, re- the, the capacity to reason to think things through. We find multiple times throughout the Bible that we, are, we ought to attain wisdom, we ought to get understanding, we ought to be discerning. Uh, and that's all mental stuff, okay? Now, when you think about it, when as Christians, when we fail, typically it's because we yield to the emotion side of our lives because it feels good, right? When we fail, think about it. A Christian man, let's say he has an affair on his wife. It's not like he and his wife got together and said, hey, you know, we sat down and we talked about it. We reasoned together. and We just think, you know, this was the best thing for him to do, to go have an affair. That's not what they do, right? No, the, the man says, no, you know what? I really connected with this woman and, and it just felt good. I, I followed my heart, you know. I, uh, it, we, we sin based on emotion, based on feeling, because it feels good or it felt right. Why did you uh, cuss out your boss and lose your job? Well, I got angry. I got angry. I, I exploded. I, I lost control. How, how did you get so far in debt? Well, you know, I shop a lot because it makes me feel good. And we, we, we perform all these sins in our lives because it feels good, not because we're just going to reason it out and say, well, you know, I'm going to choose to sin today. I'm going to choose to murder some guy today. I don't know, just because, you know, I reasoned it out. No, we do it based on feelings and, and emotions. If we're going to survive these challenges, these temptations on this earth, we've got to grow up mentally. And here's, here's the goal. Write this in your notes. We need to move from being emotionally driven to being scripturally driven. Scripturally driven. Notice I didn't say that we need to be rationally driven or we need to be uh, driven by reason. No, we need to be scripturally driven uh, because Solomon says there is a way that seems right to a person. We can reason in our mind that this seems right, but Solomon says it, in its end it leads to death. So we've got to be careful, even in our own human reasoning, we can get in trouble. So we need to be scripturally driven. Here's what I mean. After John baptized Jesus, remember Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And after 40 days and 40 nights of this intense fasting, Jesus is hungry and Satan knows it. And he comes to Jesus and he says, man, you got to be hungry. Oh yeah, I'm hungry. And he says, if you're the Son of God, then you can tell these st- uh, stones to, to turn into bread. You can eat, man. And had, Je- had Jesus simply been listening to his heart, or if he had 
trusted his gut that was growling and saying, feed me, right? He would have given in. But Jesus, being scripturally driven, he goes right to the Word of God. He says, you know what? It's written in, in the Word. It's written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God's mouth. And temptation after temptation, Jesus comes back to Satan with Scripture to defeat Satan, all right? So, let me ask you this. How ready are you? How ready are you? Peter tells us to have our minds ready for action. The idea gets lost in our English translations. It's kind of sad, but in the original language, in the Greek here, the idea is that this is a continued action. In other words, Peter is telling us, you've got to keep on getting your mind ready for action. You've got to keep on doing this. How do you do this? Well, I can't stress this enough. We need spiritual giants to rise up in the church to become spiritual giants by reading your Bible daily. You don't get to 100% perfection. You keep learning new things. You need, we, we need spiritual giants to rise up to become spiritual giants who are, by spending time with God daily, who are hungry to know God's will and are searching to do God's will every, every day, day in and day out. We need spiritual giants who are saturating their minds with God's Word on a daily basis. That's how we get our minds ready, by getting into here as much as we can so we can be ready to take on Satan. Are you ready until, Paul says in Ephesians, we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Can people look at you and say, yep, you look just like Jesus? That's the goal. We need to grow mentally. We do that by getting into the Word. Let's move on. Um, to the next few verses, 1 Peter 1, uh, 14 through 16. He writes, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. Again, I think we hear, grow up, right? He says, But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, God says, Be holy because I am holy. Peter reminds us to be holy holy as God is holy. The second way we're going to grow in Christ is we've got to grow morally. Now more than ever, we need Christians to rise up who have moral values in this world. It is getting bad out there. It's getting terrible out there. We need Christians. We need the church. I am praying that God rises up, raises up leaders in our church who will become these spiritual giants to to have an influence in this world morally. How? We've got to be holy as God is holy. What's this word holy? We have the Holy Bible, we have the Holy Lands, we have the Holy Spirit, we have Holy Moly. <laughs> what, what's this word holy mean anyway? We talked last week that the word holy means that we're set apart for God's purposes. He has called us to do something for Him, to make a difference in this world. I like the word distinctive. You might write that in your notes somewhere. We are called to be distinctive in this world. We ought to be distinctive in this world. We ought to stand out as Christians because we're fulfilling Jesus' words. Jesus said, the world will know you're my disciples by your what? Love. If we're really loving, if we're truly loving other people in this world, people will know that we are Christians. We are standing out, that we are distinctive in this life. And so, yes, I do want to say this. Being holy does mean that we work hard to remove the sinful parts of our lives, that we try to become moral people. But it's not just about that. It's not just about Christians who don't get drunk and don't do drugs or don't lie or don't cheat or don't use profanity or don't cheat on their wives or their husbands. It's not just, holiness is not just the absence of immorality, nor does it mean that we're weird. Right? Holiness. Some, some, we might equate holiness with wor- weird. Uh, it doesn't mean you've got to dress like a Puritan. Right? It doesn't mean that you have to be odd for God. <laughs> All right? Holiness is so much more than that. It's not just an appropriate amount of sin avoidance. It's more about the passionate pursuit to look like Jesus in this world so that it draws people to Jesus like a magnet. That's what God is calling us to do, 
to look different, to be distinctive in this world. And I'll tell you this, becoming holy, it's not an instantaneous thing. <coughs> it's something that you develop as you grow up in Christ, right? Brand new Christians coming to Jesus, you know, they bring a lot of worldly baggage. They, they bring a lot of uh, profane habits. And while it may take a while to remove some of that stuff from their lives and replace it with God's character, at least they're working on it. As we grow up in Christ, we can, we can move on from, as Peter said, conforming to our old desires. That we grow up and we conform to God's character. Listen, if a one-year-old child who's learning to walk, you know, stumbles and falls, we might kind of giggle and laugh. Oh, you fell down again. We encourage that child to get up and walk some more, you know, so they get it. But if a 10-year-old does the same thing, repeat, repeatedly stumbles and falls, it's a sign that something is seriously wrong. Now listen, if you've been a Christian for 10 years or more, it's time to walk in holiness. It's time to stand up and walk without any serious problems. How do we do that? How do we grow deeper in morality? I'll give you four ways if you want to write these in your notes. Again, verse 16, God says, be holy because I am holy. Here's the first one. We need to have a desire to resemble the heavenly Father a daily desire to, to continue to look like God looks. When a child admires his father, sooner or later he'll be talking and walking and resembling his dad. If, a, if, if we love and worship our heavenly father, sooner or later we're going to start looking like our dad in heaven. It's just natural that that happens. Paul says in Ephesians 5.1, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. He gets it. We know as we look to the Father, we start looking like the Father. All right, so resemble the Heavenly Father. Here's the second one. We need to have a reverent fear of judgment. <laughs> this is a tough one. But, but Peter says this in verse 17. He says, If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially, According to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence. There's that word reverence during your time living as strangers here on earth, okay? So as we're living in, as strangers here on this earth, we are, we are to resemble the Father. We are to be imitators of Him, but we also have to keep in mind that He is going to judge us for our actions. If you knew there were surveillance cameras cap capturing your every move here on earth, do you think you'd behave a little bit differently? Oh, yeah, well, it depends on who's watching on the other side, right? But typically, I mean, if you're thinking about it, surveillance cap capturing your every move, we're going to behave a little bit differently. We're going to behave a little bit better. God warns us that we will have to give an account for even every careless word that we speak. It's going to matter that we, we're going to be judged on that in some way. And so sometimes we do the right thing because we love God, but a lot, sometimes we do the right thing because we know we're going to be judged by God. So the motivator for holiness is that God's going to judge us, and we've got to have a reverent fear for that, okay? Here's the third one. We need to recognize the futility of unholiness. Make sure you write that word down correctly, unholiness. I don't know if it's actually a real word, but... <laughs> Recognize the futility of unholiness or ungodliness or sin. Verse 18 says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life. You should underline that phrase, empty way of life. That's the futility part. Um, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold. So Peter calls the ungodly life, the unholy life, this empty way of life. It's not fulfilling when we sin. A lot of times we feel guilty. It's like receiving a grade we didn't earn. Or when you wake up every day, day in and day out with a hangover, like, why did I do that again? Or if you go to, a, go to bed with a person, wake up with a person who doesn't share your name or your ring, God has created within us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit so that we, when we do those bad things, we feel hollow or we feel unfulfilled, or we feel guilty, or we feel regretful, we feel empty. It's futile to keep on doing bad things in this life, to keep on sinning. It's futile to keep living unholy lives. The prodigal son is, is the perfect example of this. He, he went off and partied hard until he lost his money, he lost his friends, 
He wakes up one day experiencing an empty stomach and an empty soul there in the pig pen, and he comes to his senses and he says, man, you know what? This is stupid. Why did I do this? I've blown it. There's the futile feeling, the, the emptiness he felt. He says, I'm getting out of here. I'm going back to my father's house where it would be better for me to live as a servant there than it would be to live as a slave here in this pig pen. So he goes back home. He makes it right. How many times do we have to go through the same thing, go through that empty feeling time and time again after we've messed up again before we conclude, you know what? It's not worth it. I need to live a holy life. Here's the fourth one. Realize the uh, loving sacrifice of Jesus. We need to realize how amazing that is in our lives. Um, Peter says, you were redeemed, verse 19, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Listen, the cross was no accident. It was an appointment. The cross was not a human tragedy. It was divine strategy. God planned it before time began. It was part of His plan that Jesus would come and die on a cross for you. Why? Because He loves you. You matter to Him. No other person in this world is going to love you that much. No other person is going to give up his flesh or her flesh and blood on your behalf. And because Jesus died for me, I want to live for him. There's motivation. If I'm going to try to live this holy life and be moral in my life, I've got to think, you know what, Jesus did this for me. The least I can do is, is live for him. All right? So we're going to grow deeper in Christ mentally, morally, and finally we're going to grow in Christ deeper in Christ socially socially. Uh, Peter says, since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other, he says, then from a pure heart, love one another what? Constantly. Do you struggle with that? Oh man, it's, it's tough to love certain people. <laughs> yes. You can shake your head yes. We're all Christians. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Not everybody is easy to love. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. One of, the, one of the most difficult lessons, I think, for um, children to learn is to learn how to be unselfish. You know, as parents, we, we taught our children over and over and over again, you got to learn how to share, right? Just share. Please just share. And so um, we, we, we teach that to our children, but the same is true spiritually. One of the most difficult lessons, I think, to live in the Christian life is to put others ahead of myself. Think about it. I want what I want. When it comes to my Christianity, when I go to church, I want my needs met. I want my music sung, or I want my type of sermons to be preached. Uh, I, I want my seat. <laughs> Oh, we fight over seats like we grow horns and we're like, oh, get out of my seat. Uh, I won, I won, I won, I won. You know, we just keep going on and on about how much I want. And when we don't get our way as Christians, we throw these adult temper tantrums. Eh, you know? Why is that? We have these personal preferences. Maybe we haven't grown up. John Ortberg, in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, he tells a, a story about this old Christian guy named Hank who complained about everything in the church. That was his job. I think it, it was ordained or something. Um, but it was, he, he just complained about everything in the church. There was a long stretch when his primary complaint was that the music in the church was too loud. And so he went to the elders, he went to the deacons, he went to the church staff, the, the ministry staff, he went to the ushers, and eventually he started complaining to, to the guests. The first time guests would walk through the door, and he would say, oh man, I don't know if you want to come in here, the music's too loud. He was driving people away. All right, so the leaders, they met with him, the elders got together, they met with Hank, and they said, listen man, you know, uh, we just need you to kind of keep quiet. Uh, if you want to complain, if you, why don't you just air them out to, your, to the closest of your friends? You know, you have a right. That's fine. We get that. But please, you know, don't complain to our guests. You know, just, just kind of grow up a little bit. 
Well, this didn't stop Hank's complaining. In fact, it got worse. Yes, it did. One day the secretary buzzed the preacher. She says, uh, there's, there's a man from OSHA here to see you. <laughs> OSHA. Hank had called the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They sent out a federal agent. This is a true story, by the way. You think this stuff doesn't It happens, man. So this federal agent shows up to check out the, the loudness of the music in the church. The minister tells the agent, listen, we don't mean to make light of this situation, but nothing like this has ever happened before. <laughs> the agent said, you don't have to apologize. Listen, when, you have no idea how much ridicule I faced in the office when every, everyone found out that I was going out to bust a church. <laughs> now, I don't want to give anyone any ideas here, all right? <laughs> I'll admit, things can get a little loud in here. It happens, and we, we try. Gary, we try, don't we? We want to try to curb this. We want to make it comfortable, and so we are monitoring the situation, all right? Um, but, and so you do have a right to express your concern. We want you to know that. Please uh, let us know. Um, but, but listen, Hank had been in the church for years, and he had not grown beyond his own selfish interests. Ortberg said he scared off visitors. He was a hindrance to church growth. He damaged the church's reputation all because he didn't get his way. We don't want that here, right? Ortberg wrote this. He said, Hank could not effectively love his wife or his children or people outside his family. He was easily irritated. He had little use for the poor and a casual contempt for those whose accents or skin pigment differed from his own. Whatever capacity he once might have had for joy or wonder or gratitude atrophied. He says he critiqued and judged and complained, and his soul got a little smaller each year. We've got to grow up. If we're going to grow as Christians, here's the deal. We've got to move from being self-centered to being others-centered. We've got to care about people. We're going to need to love everyone, everywhere. Peter uses two different words for the word love in verse 22. One is this word Philadelphia, which means what? The city of brotherly love. Yep. So he uses brotherly love. And the other one is this word agapao or agape, which is a godlike sacrificial love. I like Warren Wiersbe. He said that we share brotherly love because we are brothers and sisters in Christ and we have likenesses. And then he says, we share agape love because we belong to God and therefore we can overlook our differences. When you become a Christian, here's the deal, you enter, you in, you enter a network of Christian brothers and sisters all around the world and we're trying to learn how to love one another deeply. That network of believers is called the church. We are the church. You were bought with the same blood. You experience the same birth or rebirth. You belong to the same Father. You enjoy the same nourishment. We have the same Spirit. We are one in Jesus Christ. We have been united in Him. And so as we mature in this family and in the church worldwide, that love for each other deepens and you learn to take advantages of the opportunities to express love because you recognize that this life that we're living is short. It's fleeting. Peter says this, 24 and 25, All flesh is like grass. And all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This life is going gonna, is gonna to end soon. The more mature Christians recognize that life does not go on forever, and it is short. People die, and your chance of influencing them is temporary. And so our job is to take advantage of the opportunities that we have to express love while people are still alive. Not to sit around and complain or slander or gossip. We've got a job to do. We need to look more like Christ. And, and so in order for our love to deepen, Peter then goes in, in chapter 2, he says this in verse 1, he says, rid yourselves, and I like the word there for rid yourselves because it means to remove the soiled clothing. Of what? All malice. There's that word kaka. Boy, we keep coming back to that here in the church, don't we? <laughs> Get rid of the caca in your life, the evil in your life, the malice in your life. He says, get rid of that, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Now listen, if you've been a Christian for a long time, 
and you're still nurturing hatred and bitterness in your soul and toward others, or you're refusing to speak to certain people, or all you do is complain about everything that you see and do, or you're slandering people all the time, or you're putting on this show, this fake face to make it look like you have it all together spiritually, if you're lying continually and trying to deceive people continually to get your way, you're being childish and you need to grow up. It's time. It's time to grow up. And so I want to close with this question. Do you have anything in life to do that is more important than this? Is there anything else in your life that is more important than to grow up in Christ? More important. I mean, okay, so think about your vision for your life, right? Your vision for your life. Graduate college, get a job, make lots of money, find that special person to spend the rest of your life with, to buy the house you've always dreamed of, um, to retire someday, for the Browns to win a Super Bowl someday. Please, Lord. (laughs) These are all good visions to have for your life. There's no doubt about it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But I want to ask yourself, does your vision for your life include becoming a spiritual giant? That people can look at and say, yeah, man, I want to be like that person. To make a difference for Jesus, to to grow deeper in your faith. Does your life vision include that? Man, I hope so. I'm praying it does. And what does that look like? Are you motivated to look like Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Are you willing to submit to His will? Because listen, we have the means to look more and more like Jesus, right? It's right here. Getting into this, growing more mentally, spiritually, It's right here on Sunday mornings to to come in here and worship together and be excited about it and see how Jesus is moving in in each other's lives to worship together and and to dive in and get the meat of the Word. It's here and it's it's here, your relationship with God. We have the means to grow as Christians. Is is there anything else in your life more important than this? I, I hope and pray that you're getting it.